welcome everyone. Uh, it is my uh, privilege and pleasure to uh, have this uh, phenomenal session on behalf of the APSA Education Committee uh, on the topic of adolescent inguinal hernia. We have the following objectives to discuss today. We're gonna review the effectiveness of the operative techniques for adolescents with inguinal hernias, and we're gonna discuss the best available evidence. We're also gonna discuss the approach to those with a recurrent inguinal hernia as a teenager who have previously undergone a high ligation type operation. I am uh, fortunate to have been uh, blessed to uh, work with a, a great group of what we call our working group that we set up this um, agenda and decided on on the cases we're gonna be discussing today. So um, Brian Gulak from uh, Rush University in Chicago, Mike Livingston from uh, Golisano Children's in Rochester, New York, Justin Wagner from UCLA, Jill Whitehouse from uh, Hollywood, Florida from Joe DiMaggio Children's, and myself from Boston Children's Hospital. I'm more excited to present to you our excellent and amazing uh, panel. It's very diverse from backgrounds in different uh, geographic locations as well as uh, practice type settings. We have Dr. Griffiths, from uh, upstate New York. Uh, he's a community general surgeon, and he also is a um, program director there for the general surgery um, program and trains residents that are gonna go out in our communities to do these uh, hernia repairs in teenagers and young adults as well. We have uh, Dr. Ian McQueen and Dr. David Chen from the Lichtenstein Mid Hernia Clinic from also UC UCLA area. And um, it's gonna be phenomenal to hear their experience uh, treating thousands of these hernias in young adults as well. Dr. Chen is also the current president of the America's Hernia Society, so we're excited to have him on board. Dr. Buckmiller is my colleague and partner, and she also taught me a lot of what I know about treating inguinal hernias when I did my fellowship here at Boston Children's. She's well known for her work on congenital diaphragmatic hernias, but also has a very busy practice with uh, bread and butter general surgery. Uh, Dr. Ponsky uh, is from our Midwest uh, and uh, currently in Cincinnati, and he um, is well known by our uh, group as well. He's the current president of IPEG and is a expert in laparoscopic inguinal hernia in children. So this is a healthy 15 year old boy who's referred to your clinic with a reducible right inguinal hernia. There are no other hernias palpable and he has no comorbidities. His mother asks how you would repair it and why. I would offer this patient a uh, high ligation. I would, uh, I would offer an open uh, high ligation uh, initially, but I would also chat with them about his level of sporting activity and, and kind of gauge that as I've been trying to embrace some of the new laparoscopic techniques. And so I would get a sense of his level of athleticism and uh, return to recovery. I would advocate for a open high ligation. We've heard uh, open high ligation so far, maybe a little bit of laparoscopic high ligation. Uh, what I haven't heard, and Ian, aren't you an adult uh, hernia surgeon? I am an adult hernia surgeon. I am so shocked that you just said that you would do an open high ligation because most of your colleagues would not answer that way as my uh, guess. I, I can't break with the crowd on the very first one. <laughs> so so that's the big question. Is this is this a 15 year old going to get mesh or is this 15 year old going to get a high ligation? Uh, you're 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 a cat among dogs here because uh, we're all going to say high ligation. And that's the argument. And I would say that a high a a, a 15 year old by the data that we've looked at is almost certainly going to have a, a greater than, than probably 90% chance is going to be an indirect inguinal hernia, which we know is a patent process as vaginalis. And that responds to a high ligation. Now I think either open or lap are fine. I'm preferential to the laparoscopic high ligation for a multitude of reasons. I think that it's, uh, it's a very uh, durable repair. It's minimal pain. Uh, the cosmesis is no better than open, uh, but it is something that is a good trick for all surgeons, I think, to learn because in a very difficult hernia, where it's a high risk neo, uh, preemie hernia uh, that's been incarcerated, the, the, high, the laparoscopic repair is not difficult. So it's a good thing for surgeons to learn, but I think either open or lap is fine. And that's my preference is laparoscopic high ligation. Interestingly, there are only a few published studies that report specifically on the outcomes of inguinal hernia repair in adolescents. This first study from Akron and Kansas City reported a occurrence rate of only 2% following open high ligation in 210 adolescents aged 12 to 19 years old. Similar findings were reported from the Netherlands in this study of 234 young adults who underwent open high ligation. 
Their occurrence rate was 0% among patients 18 to 25 years old and 9% among those aged 25 to 40 years old. This next study from Salt Lake City reported a recurrence rate of 6% among 256 adolescents with inguinal hernia. Almost 80% underwent open high ligation alone, but the remainder had a tissue repair at the time of surgery to reinforce the floor of the inguinal canal. This study from Ann Arbor compared outcomes for adolescents who uh, mostly underwent open high ligation versus young adults who underwent a mesh repair via open or laparoscopic surgery. Interestingly, the recurrence rates were approximately 6% in both groups. What about the role of laparoscopy? This multi-center study coordinated by Akron Children's Hospital recorded a recurrence rate of approximately 6% among patients aged 12 to 18 years old undergoing laparoscopic high ligation. Similarly, a pediatric surgeon from South Korea reported a recurrence rate of 3% among 115 adolescents aged 11 to 18 years old who underwent laparoscopic high ligation alone. This appeared to decrease to 0% when a laparoscopic Bassini-like tissue repair was used in addition to laparoscopic high ligation alone. Similar report findings were reported from Beijing in a study that included over 400 adolescents undergoing inguinal hernia repair. The recurrence rate was 3% among those who underwent laparoscopic high ligation. This decreased to 0% when patients underwent laparoscopic high ligation alone for small defects or open high ligation and placement of a biologic mesh for larger defects or in patients who are high risk but still had small defects. Finally, this abstract from 2019 reported on the incidence of direct hernias among pediatric and adult patients undergoing inguinal hernia repair. The frequency increased from 7% in patients aged 11 to 14 years old, 10% among those 14 to 18 years old, and 29% in patients 18 to 21 years. One wonders if the approximately 6% rate of recurrence seen in some of the previous studies is driven in part by the presence of direct hernias that were not recognized and repaired at the time of initial surgery. Let's talk about the data. So first of all, it looks like the laparoscopic high ligation in all the studies has been 3%, except for ours, which showed 6%. What we remarked in that study was that there were many centers all over the world, and there was one radical outlier who had a much different recurrence rate than everyone else. And when we removed that outlier, it was 3% among all the other hospitals. So that is in line with all the others. So my guess is the more accurate number to look at for the laparoscopic high ligation is shown by multiple studies there is 3%. The in interesting thing about the paper that you showed with the direct hernias. So what we were trying to figure out is at what age should we stop doing, when do kids stop becoming kids and start becoming adults. And we can't figure that out. No one can decide when does a child stop getting a high ligation and start getting mesh and, or, or tissue. And, and the answer for that is that we said, well, maybe the physiology is different in an adult and a kid. And we know that there's a change because kids don't get direct hernias and adults do get direct hernias. So we look to see when do people, when do kids start getting direct hernias? Maybe that's when their physiology starts becoming more adult-like. And we saw that that was around anywhere between 18 and 30 years, you saw the graph shoot up. So the point there is below 18, it was still really almost all not directs, which means those kids could, are probably still kids and should be getting a high ligation. I agree with what, what Todd said, but I think we have to be prepared, obviously, to adjust to the, to the anatomy that we find during the operation and have the facility to do a mesh plug if that's needed. Or if you go in and it turns out there is no uh, hernia sac or patent processes, you can adjust and have those techniques as part of your armamentarium. I would also like to say that, as mentioned in the discussion, that in the hands of experienced surgeons, I would admit that I have very limited experience with the laparoscopic high ligation. So um, a open high ligation would be my preferred technique. Exactly right that there's a point at which these teenagers, sometimes the teenagers go from having child physiology to adult physiology. And there's both the uh, hernia formation physiology and that they've, they have disruption of the inguinal floor and form these direct defects. There's also the physiology of how they react to having mesh put in. And so there's, there's probably the point at which they stop growing and you stop having abdominal wall stress and distortion from the mesh being in there. And that's likely earlier than that kind of, you know, 18 to 30 year old range where the 
physiology changes in terms of stress on the inguinal floor. Um, so that's the reason I advocate for kind of a less is more approach with the high ligation in, in these younger teens and adolescents. Um, but I'll also say the, the first study you showed, I think, had the longest follow-up of 13 years, which makes the oldest patient in follow-up there around 30 years old, which is still it's a baby in my practice. So you you deal with the fact that these may be recurring down the road. And I you know, anecdotally will say I frequently see uh, older adults who had high ligations as children who then have indirect recurrences. Um, Terry brought up an incredibly important point. The laparoscopic high ligation does not work for a direct hernia. You shouldn't try it because that is a muscle problem that needs a muscle repair. We're only talking about laparoscopic repair for a, a, a laparoscopic high ligation, sorry, is only for an indirect hernia. And that is an amazing point that you need to be prepared as a pediatric surgeon when you go in laparoscopically and you see a direct hernia, what's your plan? Are you going to do a are you going to do a tap or tap or are you going to open? The beautiful thing about lap high ligation, open high ligation, or, or lap mesh or open mesh is it? I really don't think it matters. Um, when Drew said in experienced hands, I do not think the lap high ligation is better than open. I think it you do with what you're comfortable with. I do think that mesh is wrong for a pediatric or an adolescent hernia. I think they should not be getting mesh. As the outsider to that discussion, initially, my initial thoughts are, it looks like everybody is in tune with a high ligation, um, either laparoscopic or open, whatever the expertise of the, um, uh, the surgeon is in the location, patient anatomy and other factors, and being prepared for uh, the potential curveballs that may happen. Talking about potential curveballs, I'm going to hand it over to um, my colleagues to discuss a few of those potential curveballs. So now we're going to say, instead, we have a 12-year-old obese boy who has reducible right inguinal hernia who says he spends most of his time during the pandemic playing video games. How would that change your approach? So I would offer an open high ligation. I would not change my approach um, to his operation uh, based on the body habitus. Amen, Terry. I totally agree. It wouldn't change my practice. Not going to change my practice either, but I would counsel him a little bit differently that he has now uh, arguably a risk factor for recurrence. I wouldn't actually say that uh, I wouldn't actually say that he has a higher risk of recurrence per se just because of obesity. I think that that's the case in adults, but probably not in kids. You know, the thing is that everything in kids is related to the size of the ring, but obesity in and of itself doesn't predispose them. David and Ian are going to tell you that we don't have long term follow up. Ian already said we don't have long term follow up. Ben, Zendejas, wouldn't it be amazing if somebody did like a 50-year follow-up on these kids to see if we really knew? Would. We did do that. We didn't talk about that in the previous literature, but uh, it was very interesting when we, when we looked at that, that the hernias that developed over time in these pediatric patients were more direct uh, rather than indirect, which is sort of what we were talking about the, earlier about the physiology of the, um, the abdominal wall and at what point does it become more of a direct inguinal hernia component. So... But the reality is that, as you guys have brought up, it's a different disease process. You know, and I, I think that kid hernias, you try to treat it all the time as a kid. And adult hernias, you know, you, they're, they're direct hernias are clearly different. And then kid hernias that last too long, they disrupt the floor and they become, you know, they become a different disease process too. Uh, you have a 15-year-old boy now, and you're operating a, electively doing a laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair, and you find that it's a direct inguinal hernia. What do you do? I think that in this case, you know, I'll tell you what not to do. So um, I, I definitely would say don't do not do a suture closure of the direct space because you just risk giving them pain, you know. So I think that, um, a, you know, obviously that's very uncommon, a 15-year-old with a direct. Um, I think that if you're facile laparoscopically, you can do what's called a, a iliopubic tract repair, which was a true nihus repair very hard to do that laparoscopically. Some folks have tried to do that robotically and you just have to take super small bites along the iliopubic tract because anything deeper risks nerve injury. Uh, and you know, we, kids do have problems and you know, we don't, we don't really talk about it, but there are adults that had hernia repairs as kids and then they have, they still have pain. And, you know, they'll, they'll definitely still say that that's a relevant issue. So I would say just don't, you know, don't take big bites there. The, if you aren't able to do that laparoscopically or robotically, your best bet is just make an open incision and do a tissue repair where you can see where the nerves are and just close the floor. So I have not done a 
I'm cur- I have not done a tap or a tap repair since I was a general surgery resident. So I don't feel good at it. So I would open and I would either do a tissue repair or a mesh repair open. Hey, Dr. Buckmiller, I need your help here. Female to female. All right, here's the curveball. So 17 year old female shows up. Similar story as our first scenario, reducible inguinal hernia. She's relatively active, not obese. Uh, what is your approach for a female? I would, uh, I would offer her an open uh, high ligation and I would assess uh, the ring and I would probably do, quote, the old fashioned Bassini repair, which is why I have uh, dinosaurs on my screen background. Um, if she was an incredible athlete and really wanted to get back to competitive sports, um, I might have a discussion with uh, Zendejas down the hall about doing it laparoscopically. I would actually offer her a laparoscopic repair. Um, after review of the literature, um, clearly, you know, uh, a, a girl does not have a process of vaginalis, but they have what's called a canal of NUC, which is the analog to a process of vaginalis. And they also have a much higher incidence of bilateral inguinal hernias than their male counterparts, almost twice as high. And uh, there's also a, a risk of ovarian herniation and a small risk, somewhere around 6% risk of ovarian strangulation. So I, I would actually offer her um, a laparoscopic, possibly bilateral hernia repair. Well, I'm just gonna tell you that I know that Drew and Ian are like salivating. They wanna put mesh in this girl. So uh, this still 17, no mesh, I would do a laparoscopic high ligation. Although based on the group, Jorge Godoy's group down in Santiago, Chile, I would cauterize and burn that process, that processes vaginalis in, in what we call burnia. And then I would put a stitch in laparoscopically. Not fully salivating yet, but this is kind of the earliest age at which, you know, some 17 year old girls are physiologically adult women and some are physiologically still growing and, and still more physiologic children. So I think there's some gray area to kind of try to hash that out with the patient. And this is kind of the youngest that I would consider a mesh based repair. I would say that, you know, I mean, I think that uh, it's always good to have, you know, where you get Todd's perspective on it because they really have been able to push the envelope of, you know, what can you do as a tissue repair, especially in large people, you know, because he's really pushed the pediatric repair into adults and said, what happens? And we clearly know that it fails sometimes, but there are subgroups that don't need mesh. And if you have a 17 year old, you know, you have to be really thoughtful about it that, you know, from the point of view of hernia, absolutely. You put a piece of mesh in, we're never going back there. You know, as a good laparoscopic repair, you cover the whole myopectineal orifice, you're done for life. There is a possibility of bilaterality. Um, the data clearly supports in a, in a female patient to do a laparoscopic repair because of the coexistence of femoral hernias. There's no doubt about that. But I wouldn't necessarily translate that to a 17 year old. I mean, I think that, you know, it, I, I would probably say I'd be okay with having a 17 year old recur at some point in your life if it's not, you know, if it's not a big deal and it's not very painful to her. So I would have a very clear discussion to put a piece of mesh in the 17 year old is not benign. You know, I, I see probably 250 to 300 patients a year that have pain after hernia surgeries. And if, uh, if you have someone who's doing a great job, it's probably going to be fine, but you just would kick yourself if she had, you know, problems afterwards. Uh, going back to what Todd said about doing a high ligation and, you know, the key to high ligation is also you got to burn the peritoneum. You have to cause a defect and that. They've clearly showed that, you know, in the, ch- I have uh, Chinese colleagues that they've done the Ponsky repair, very, you know, that kind of thing, but in 4,000 patients. And it's so key to, to burn that peritoneum. But in a woman, you actually can transect the round ligament. And that actually would be another option to that is instead of trying to burn the peritoneum on a, on a female where that canal of nook uh, invaginates next to the round ligament, you could just, you can take the round ligament without any problem proximal to the internal ring. If you take the round ligament in an open surgery, you're gonna take their genital nerve and their ilioinguinal nerve and they're gonna have some numbness. But if you take it laparoscopically, you have no problem. Exactly. The question is, what do you tell your patients, either you or Ian, about the incidence? And I know you. I know we've talked about this a lot. That it's not the same with every surgeon. What's the incidence of chronic pain with mesh? You know, I mean, what we quote, what we quote is six to eight percent all comers. But it all depends on what you, you know, it's all it all depends on what questions you ask and what you're really asking. If you talk about 
any pain. It can be, you know, the whole range goes from like zero to 63%. If you talk about, um, you know, severe pain affecting quality of life, you still have where that, you know, that can be 5% of patients will have some, you know, limitation based on it. Now, if you do perfect surgery, so if you take, you know, all surgical literature sucks. The only thing that, you know, never corrects for the one thing that matters is a surgeon. You know, so if you have a surgeon who's an expert, their incidence of pain should be less than half a percent. But if you take all comers, I mean, that's not great numbers, you know? So um, it's not that I wouldn't put a piece of mesh in her, absolutely. I mean, if that's what they wanted, if she was a professional athlete or whatever, but I would say in a 17 year old, I'm with you, Todd. Like if she was, and, and like, why does the conversation change at 19 or 21 or 24, you know? I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know that. I think that what we do know in young women, so all the hernia literature from adults uh, excludes everyone below 18. But in young women, we know that there's a subset of patients who do well uh, with small, with uh, open small little hernia repairs as tissue repairs, either shoulder ice or even just like, as you described, just a, uh, you know, a high ligation with a, with like a Marcy suture. But it looks like uh, the overall consensus based on uh, the discussion with our expert uh, in our, our panel and the review of the literature, the high ligation via open surgery and laparoscopy are both excellent uh, techniques for adolescents. Um, it ultimately will depend on the experience of the surgeon. Laparoscopy appears to does have a bit of a learning curve with the, particularly that study that we saw by Dr. Ponsky and his group where uh, overall it, the recurrence significantly less with the um, laparoscopic approach for the experienced surgeons. But overall, it looks like the recurrence is less than 6%, probably. And as we were talking about, an experienced hand should probably be a lot less than that. Um, it, and we were talking about the scenarios in where mesh or tissue repair were reasonable to consider, particularly those that were direct defects. Um, and the option of, or the benefit of laparoscopy for evaluating the contralateral side or evaluating for a direct or ephemeral hernia if, if an indirect was not found. This is a 16 year old boy who um, underwent open high ligation a year ago. Um, and he now presents with a reducible right angle hernia recurrence on physical examination. And um, now the mom's asking you, how are you gonna fix this? So after examining the patient, finding the recurrent right inguinal hernia, I would counsel them that I would not do another open repair because of the scarring in the area. And also the anatomy has been distorted from prior surgery. I would recommend uh, a laparoscopic repair this time around, either laparoscopic high ligation. I know there are some who do a percutaneous internal ring closure. So I would definitely offer a laparoscopic hernia repair in this case. Tough case. Um, let me first answer that if there's a recurrence in general from a laparoscopic or open high, lig high ligation, I will do a laparoscopic high ligation for exactly the reasons Drew just said. Um, it, I think the laparoscopic repair is safer for the for the spermatic cord to begin with in a, in a de novo case, but especially in a recurrence. So I would do that. However, now you're getting to this, the adolescent where we said before, I would justify doing a laparoscopic high ligation because the worst that could happen is a recurrence and then you could get mesh. Well, I have to be honest with that now and say, okay, so now we have a recurrence. I would have a discussion with the family on their risk profile with mesh, the potential pain with mesh or trying again with laparoscopic high ligation uh, or with a high ligation. If they're okay with trying a laparoscopic high ligation, I'll do it. But I will absolutely say this is what, and I've done this, I agree with Drew, it should be done laparoscopically because the groin's been messed with. I would send them to one of my adult colleagues for a second opinion. And uh, I've done that quite a bit and let them decide after hearing both arguments. Okay, and if you had done it laparoscopically first, would you now go open? Question no. being, would you, would you always go opposite? No, 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 I would always, I would, so, I would always do the first and the second laparoscopically. In other words, if it was the first case, I do it lap. And if it was done open or lap, I would still go lap because it's the safest because you're not messing with the spermatic cord laparoscopically. Uh, I do agree. I think that uh, reoperation should be done laparoscopically, but we're in that age group and, and I'm in the, the training group that I, I, I didn't learn how to do these as an adult general surgeon, you know, 25, 30 years ago, we just didn't know how to do them. So I would do this with a colleague, I would do it at, at my 
primary institution, not at a satellite, so that we would have a couple set of eyes on it to give them the most um, durable repair. I'd uh, similarly offer them a second opinion with a pediatric surgeon, but I think that at the point that the first operations failed, you have to ask, was it a failure of the ligation or is it that the floor is disrupted and so this is a true recurrence? And I think for that, for that uh, pathophysiology, you need some sort of uh, either tissue or mesh repair. So 16 years old, I'd be reluctant to put mesh in, in a boy, um, but I do think you could offer them um, an open tissue repair. And I know the, the conventional thinking is often, oh, if there's a recurrence from an open surgery, go back laparoscopically. And that makes sense in the adult guidelines where there's almost always mesh. And if not mesh, there's at least been a tissue repair and manipulation of the uh, inguinal floor and the abdominal wall. Um, for these high ligations, there's a, there's a minimum of scar tissue there. It's uh, not, you know, if you, if you are relatively experienced with uh, opening reoperative groins, it's pretty straightforward to reoperate in a groin where there's just been a high ligation and it's uh, relatively safe to go do a tissue or mesh piece to repair in that setting. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would definitely agree with that, that um, the adult data shouldn't be translated to kids, because I think that if you are only doing a high ligation, you know, your path of destruction is not so great. It's mesh that causes the, causes the inflammatory reaction. And that being said, you know, if you go to someone experienced, I mean, we re routinely operate on, you know, multiple pieces of mesh in the groin. You can go back. It's just more of a pain. So like, like Todd says, why not just go lap? Because you just don't need to deal with it. The more important reason to probably go lap is to assess what the mechanism of failure was. If you go open, you'll never really know. So then you can tell, as Ian said, did you fail to ligate the whole thing? Did you not bring it down far enough? Did you leave a pay the, the processes intact? Or is it that the ring is too big or is the floor disrupted? If you then go in lap, you have dealer's choice. You know, if it looks like there's just a sack that's still left, you can high ligate it again, no problem. But if there's a direct defect for whatever reason, you know, in a 16 year old, then you would say, okay, that probably would warrant a tissue repair or a mesh repair if they're big, you know, big for their age. But it's just like, that's the biggest reason to go lap is that you cannot, you can, as Todd said, you can go back lap again. And that's also where it, where you don't want to translate from adult surgery because the thought in laparoscopic surgery for adults is you never want to go back lap unless you're an expert because that's going to be really difficult with preperitoneal mesh. Um, but with the high ligation, no reason why not to. And then you can get a lay of the land and decide what the best way to approach it is. I like the why not just go lap. Maybe we should have titled this entire session that. There are actually remarkably few studies that address the issue of recurrence in adolescents with inguinal hernias who underwent high ligation alone. This narrative review from Finland noted that the laparoscopic approach for recurrent inguinal hernia is ideal. This distinguishes between true recurrence and an unrepaired direct or femoral hernia. It also avoids dissection and scarred tissue. The author noted that surgeons should use two permanent first string sutures, but it remains unclear whether this is sufficient in adolescents. This next study from Egypt reported positive results in children and some adolescents with a recurrent inguinal hernia. The author used laparoscopy to excise the hernia sac and performed a Bassini-like tissue repair. A similar technique uh, was described from a surgeon in South Korea. What can we extrapolate from the adult literature? As already mentioned, uh, international hernia guidelines recommend laparoscopic repair after open recurrence, open repair after laparoscopic recurrence, and referral to an expert hernia surgeon after two recurrences. Recent pediatric hernia guidelines from Europe do not address the optimal approach to recurrence in adolescents who have previously undergone open high ligation or laparoscopic high ligation. The yes, no question, that's all you get, yes, no. <laughs> Should mesh be used for most recurrences? Dr. Griffith, yes or no? I would say no. Okay, Dr. Chen, yes or no? No. Dr. McQueen. No. Dr. Ponsky. No. Dr. Buckmiller. Nope. It's unanimous. So uh, I really like the uh, the comment by Dr. Chen about the laparoscopy to try to understand the problem, try to understand why this happened. Uh, that's sort of my strategy usually. So that value of laparoscopy to understand what went wrong uh, and to not make the same mistake again, I think is very valuable. Uh, the idea of then tailoring that treatment uh, for the, the cause of the recurrence, I think is key. And that's why mesh may not always be the answer. Sometimes the tissue repair 
or or a redo high ligation maybe the answer if that's if that's what the problem was right and so i think we also talked about the not taking too literal the guidelines for adults that are usually um the recommendations based on assuming a prior potentially mesh based repair about going to the opposite side um following that uh, recurrence. And so there is uh, some role for going in the same uh, approach, uh, either laparoscopic for a prior failed laparoscopic approach or open for a prior open approach. But I think though that it is, you know, especially in the scope of practice of pediatric surgery, I do think that it's helpful for you to tell, to kind of be proscriptive of telling pediatric surgeons when it is appropriate to use mesh, you know? So, I mean, I think that just because you had a recurrence doesn't mean you need to use a piece of mesh. I think it's more related to what's the pathology and what's the, you know, it, what's, if you like a classification system, if you have any medial hernia, so any, any direct hernia probably does make sense to think about that or do a tissue repair. And if you have a small lateral recurrence, I'd say there's no reason to use a mesh. I would, the way I would reframe that last question you guys had. So in any recurrence, I think mesh should at least be discussed and, and considered. Whereas I don't even consider it for a primary repair, but in a recurrence, I discuss it with the family, consider maybe having them talk to uh, an adult uh, hernia surgeon. That's the only difference. Um, the other thing is, if you go in laparoscopically, you're going to basically most of the time see a, a lot of times that it's, it's just looks like nothing was ever done. Uh, and so the question was, did your stitch fail or what uh, a, a colleague of, of ours, a friend of our, all of ours here, Mike Rosen would say, is that if the hole is too big, even if it's an indirect hernia, there's a direct component to it. In other words, it's stretched out and that may have pulled it apart. So even though it looks like it may have been a stitch failure, it may be a result of the fact that that hole is just too big and may, may deserve a, a mesh repair or a tissue repair. Needle, and then I exchange it with a non-absorbable braided and we compared all sutures and rabbits and found that the non-absorbable braided suture had the most durable impact. Okay. Dr. Um, Bachmiller, Dr. Griffiths, your, your open technique? Yeah, for open, um, I doubly highly like it with an absorbable monofilament suture. And then I do exactly the same that Todd just mentioned for the laparoscopic. Um, pass it with the permanent monofilament, uh, but then secure the, the final repair with the braided permanent. And... Uh... For, for myself, I, I do a, a tool micro for a open um, high ligation. I, I don't do um, laparoscopic repairs without mesh. Okay. And Dr. McQueen, Dr. Ten, any any thoughts on suture material? Probably, probably not much to add from the adult world, aside to say from, from an anterior repair in general, I try not to place any permanent suture aside from along the inguinal ligament. So I would use uh, an absorbable both for the ligation and for any, you know, if it was a mesh repair for any mesh placement on the medial aspect. I would use like, so for kids, um, when I, when I do them, uh, especially with the charity and things like that, we, so I'll use a Vicro for, uh, for the high ligation component. And then just uh, translating that from, you know, the adult repairs, if I do, if I do a teenager or if I do a young adult that has a disruption of the floor, I'll typically do a shoulder ice repair. And in that you typically would use a permanent suture, like a 2 proline for each of the layers. I'll sometimes cheat on a, on a young patient and would do these kind of modified shoulder ices where I'll use a PDS for the two bottom layers. Um, and just, you know, you probably don't need as much permanent material, especially in a young patient where their tissue is, uh, is obviously going to be better. Yeah. Several questions on the chat asking about robotics uh, and whether, you know, there's, I know there's a hot topic in adult hernia surgery using the robot. Anybody uh, aware of, of the use of robotics for inguinal hernia repairs in teenagers? Dr. McQueen, uh, Dr. Chen, um, what are your thoughts on, on the robot for teenagers? So, so if you're going to do a robotic repair, it necessarily has to be a uh, mesh-based repair, aside from a couple of kind of very niche techniques that maybe uh, Dr. Chen wants to comment on a little bit more. But um, I think if you've decided to do a mesh-based repair in 
a pediatric patient, it's it's an option to consider. But um, with almost all the current platforms, you're trading your typical laparoscopic five millimeter ports or smaller for eight millimeter ports. So you're you're trading quite a bit of uh, incision size overall for uh, the, lap the robotic platform. Yeah, I think that, you know, you can use the robot um, if you're going to use it for like a full adult size patient and they, they really wanted for some reason a uh, MIS technique, um, but no mesh. You can do a knee hoose repair, a robotic iliopubic tract repair, but I think it's not really kind of in the domain of what people should be learning. I think that uh, soon to come out will be newer robots and smaller robots. And, uh, you know, we have uh, FP robot right now uh, that if you think about that shrinking down for the pediatric world, soon you can, you know, it would be super easy to do you know, typical Ponsky tech and so upside down, really nice. But uh, right now it's kind of ridiculous to put an eight and a half millimeter port in any kind of a kid. Okay, we have a scenario now formed in a question. So what about the time when you're operating on a 17 year old with a bulge in the groin and groin pain and you do laparoscopy and you see no peritoneal defect? So uh, how, who would, who would explore open looking for a direct? Who would terminate the operation? Do something else. Dr. Ponsky, can you lead us off? Okay. So a hernia. You can't, Unless there's some way that someone here could tell me that I haven't thought of, if you don't see a hole laparoscopically, they don't have a hernia. So you don't have to go into the groin to look. Now, what they could have is a lipoma of the cord, and that is something to consider. The other thing is make sure that they didn't have a retractile testicle and that it was the testicle that it was in the groin. But a hernia, I think you've ruled out by looking in. Dr. Buckmiller, any other thoughts? No, actually, I completely agree with that. And I, I know that there's been some pitfalls when we're doing a lot of um, remote consultation and scheduling surgery without seeing, sometimes seeing the patient until the day of surgery. So I completely agree. You put under scope, there's no hernia, you're done. And Dr. Chen, uh, you have that, let's say no bulge, but just groin pain. You put the laparoscope in, no defect. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that Todd's point is an important one, especially as you get to full size, uh, you know, adolescents that are basically adults that uh, if it's just groin pain, it's different. And the problem is that in the adult world, especially we see a lot of this, that patient comes in and their diagnosis was groin pain. What do they get? A hernia pair, you know? And I'm sure it happens also in the pediatric world, but uh, probably less so because your barrier to operate is usually a little bit higher. So I think Todd's point is important that, you know, a cord lipoma is still considered a hernia. By definition, it passes through, but the contents are preperitoneal or retroperitoneal. Similar if you talk about like someone who's herniating their bladder. You know, you may not see it from an internal view because you don't have a peritoneal defect, but it can, from the patient's point of view, feel the same way. Hey, it's different if it's pain or if it's pain and bulge. So if it's pain and bulge and they really feel the bulge, um, you might want to take down the peritoneum and reduce out the cord lipoma. And then you can do a pediatric repair uh, at that time if they, if indicated. Uh, if it's groin pain, the only thing we'll keep it short is just that just be careful because it, you fall into the inguinal disruption, athletic pubalgia, sports hernia world. And, you know, you don't really have many good options to affect that kind of pain from your view with just a laparoscope. So many questions in the chat also about concerns about vast deference injury with either technique, open or laparoscopic. Um, we went over some of that data uh, with our discussion, but Dr. Griffiths, from a, you know, a general surgeon, like what's your perspective or impression on that? So I, I just think that um, unless you're doing it bilaterally, where you can potentially damage both vases, I, I think that's really a non-issue. Um, okay. Dr. Bugmiller, what do you tell your patients when they ask you about the risk of infertility down the road with either approach? I mean, I, I think I quote the old literature about um, injury to the vas with open repair that goes way back to, to less than 1%, but I... Unless that there's a bilateral repair and, and there's bilateral injury to the vas, which is incredible. I can't imagine that's incredibly rare. So it's a, it's on the consent, but it's in infinitesimally small. Dr. Fonsky, would you argue that the laparoscopic approach uh, uh, may be safer because you can see yes. the vest? It's safer. <laughs> I'm going to argue it's safer. Uh, I'll tell you why. Um, in the, the risk to the vas is the ones we don't recognize what we did in a preemie who
who's got a very scarred down and uh, chronically incarcerated large hernia. And we're trying to get this, the, the sack off and we're torquing on this tiny vas. We know in rabbits, if you just grab it one time with the pickups, it obliterates it. So I don't think we recognize what happens and I don't think we follow them to know. I, I, I am anticipating that there's probably uh, a high risk to the vas in those patients. Laparoscopically, the risk is a little different. The laparoscopically is if you go and pass your needle and you don't do it the right way and make sure you can always see through the peritoneum and make sure you always see your needle. And by chance you would get under the vas. The vas is pretty big. If you got it over your needle, you would see that I would think. So I think the risk is low. Last co comment I wanna make is once you've done a laparoscopic hernia and you tie it down and you squeeze it, the vas goes right next to the, all that tissue and everyone freaks out and says, oh my God, the vas is like up in there. If you watch someone do an open repair laparoscopically, it looks identical. It's all the tissue squished with the vas next to it. And by the phys forces of physics, just because it's on the outside of, of, of a knot should not impact uh, any pressure onto the vas. That's my opinion. I'll make a quick comment to that if that's okay. You know, when, when Todd started doing this, you know, he called me many times and said, am I crazy? Like, is this a good idea? You know, and, and the reality is that I 100% I agree with Todd that it's way lower risk um, to, uh, for vas injury. And the reason why is that it's just anatomy, that when you're in the groin, your intrinsic operation is separating the sac from the vas. And that's all, that's why pediatric surgeons do that repair is because it's fine surgery. And we've watched, you know, where people are, are doing ped surgeries that are not pediatric surgeons because of no availability. And it's that, that's where the trauma comes from. It's handling the vas in apposition to the sac. The beauty of the laparoscopic repair is you don't manage the sac. You transect it and you basically are staying away from the vas because you're not managing the sac along the axis of the vas. The second thing is that where you're ligating it is cephalad to the vas. So when you ligate it cephalad to the vas and you tie it down, it doesn't matter because the vas, the vas is going caudal. So I always talk to him about maybe there's a risk that you might catch the ilioinguinal nerve, but never a question about the vas. Okay, well, thanks everyone. It's been a tremendous session. Lots of great questions. I wish we could uh, stay longer to answer all of them, but uh, got to move on to the next uh, session. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Um, wow, that was a great presentation and a great discussion. We were just watching the chat board and it was blown up. <laughs> I mean, it is probably two or three times longer than any other session, but we knew that. We know what uh, our fellow pediatric surgeons are passionate about. And you, two things, inguinal hernias and appendicitis, you will draw the longest line at the microphone uh, at any APSA meeting. But um, I loved a comment by Dr. Ibrahim. He was like, mind-blowing discussion, a lot to learn. And I would agree with that. After that uh, presentation, I realized that I'm a little confused now. So I'm going to go back and probably watch that video session again and look at the chat board. But uh, appreciate all of the experts weighing in on these very, very uh, difficult clinical scenarios. I think uh, it is a field in uh, even for some, even for this. So anyways, uh, I don't know if Dr. Novotny, Dr. Rao had any comments about uh, this session. I think my mom would be proud that even though it's a minor procedure, there's lots and lots of technical variation and, and uh, it's much more complex than she ever thought. So uh, that's great. So I'm, I'm curious. Um, with us all being, I'm in my house um, and not traveling and staying in hotels and things. So I would love for people to put in the chat box what they're doing uh, with the monies that are not uh, being spent. And are you guys finding creative uses for it? Have the have your administrators taken that money away? Um, I, I would love to hear thoughts on that. So um, another way we can plug the foundation, you know, you could give a small bit that you would have spent on a dinner to the APSA Foundation. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> one more plug. I do know one thing when it comes to that money that wasn't spent, it was not given to me in a bonus. I do know that. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. 
All right, everybody. Great. Thanks so much for sticking with us. We're almost to the end of the day. What a great meeting. We have a, a really important final session, which is on um, IBD and ARES, which is the Enhanced Recovery After Surgery um, uh, sort of protocol. And I, I, this is a really important topic. There's a lot of data coming out about it. Um, and our next um, speakers are Mike, Dr. Michael Phillips from UNC, uh, Dr. Alina Barris, and Dr. Mehul Ravel, who's one of my colleagues at Lurie Children's in Chicago. And I know personally from work he shared and pre presented and published, this is just a really important area he's done so much. So I'm really looking forward to this and stay tuned. Like don't forget, yeah, don't forget, this is, sorry, Nathan's part, don't forget to hit the next <laughs> session button at the bottom. Thank you.